Hello, my friends. Um, we're going to talk about hand tools, and that is in chapter nine of your book, okay? So that's where I'm referencing, pulling these references from. Great, okay. So our first category of tools that would be categorized as hand tools, um, so like a subcategory of hand tools, are your measuring and marking tools. So these are the tools we use to both measure materials in the shop um, and also create marks that allow us to accurately cut them or adapt them into various situations. So our first regular old tool, this is one of the ones that you're gonna get for the class, right? is a tape measure and this is a steel uh tape measure right so that means this part the blade of the tape is made of steel and it is has this little curvature to it and all of that um, is part of how it retracts into the tape measure into the body of the tape measure right so into the casing so you have a spring inside, and then you have a little thumb lock, typically, on the front of it that will keep your tape measure open. Let's see if I have a tape measure hand. Hard no. Good job, Lils. Nope, no tape measures in my desk. So when you do have a tape measure, um, and you extend it to measure something, you can use this blade lock to hold the blade in its extended position so it doesn't automatically retract and then when you release it it will retract back into the tape measure so there are some secrets about your tape measure that no one ever tells you one of them is that there's this hook on the end of it which you've noticed i'm sure before because if it goes away then the blade goes all the way up into the tape measure ne never to be heard from again so that hook on the end actually has a little wiggle to it you'll notice and the reason that that's the case is to allow it to move back and forth. And that's because in some cases, right, you're going to hook the blade over an object and that would be the true measurement. But if you are um, measuring like from a wall or something, then you would actually push the hook into the object that you're measuring from. Um, and that little bit of movement allows it to slide um, and give you an accurate measurement from the outside of the hook instead of from the inside of the hook. And so that's why it has that little wiggle to it. We just talked about how the blade locks in place when you're measuring. And then because we live in America, the land of the weird imperial system, we um, have our blade of our tape measure marked in feet and inches and each marking at the fractions of inches. Um, and that is by eighths and halves and quarters and multiples of two, right? So our powers of two are the divisions that our blade is divided into. Um, and we talk about that more in the about measuring video. Um, so that is the tape measure you will have. Um, we also have open reel measuring tapes. So this is a cloth measuring tape, but it's actually fiberglass. So it's a little bit more durable than just cloth would be. Um, and this is when you have a longer distance to measure. So your standard steel tape is about 25 feet, although you can get like 16 foot or 12 foot measuring tapes that are smaller. You can throw them in your bag and it's not quite as clunky as that 25 foot steel tape. But the standard is that 25 foot steel tape. So if you have uh, a stage, for example, right, it's going to be more than 25 feet. So instead of like lining up, 25 feet and then another tape measure and then another tape measure, right? We use an open reel tape and that can be a 50 foot tape, a hundred foot tape, uh, even more than that. And that is sort of our alternative tool, right? So it is not, um, it's not as stiff, right? So you can't like extend it out. You kind of have to lay that tape along the distance that's being measured. Although if you have a friend, you can stretch it, that's great. Um, but it does allow you to measure those longer distances. You'll also find, not in the scene shop, right, but you'll find in the costume shop a smaller cloth measuring tape that's usually not made of cloth either. It's made of plastic, but um, another kind of soft measuring tape, and that's really helpful if you are measuring, like, the shape of a body, for example, which is not a straight line. Um, and so an open reel tape with a cloth tape blade to it will allow you to measure along curves or things like that, which are trickier to measure with that straight edge of your steel tape. 
So then we have layout tools. Um, and these are the tools we use to frame, right? This is a framing square to square our frames, right? And to lay out the various shapes on large surfaces or in construction situations. So part of our goal when we're like building anything in particular, right, is to get the layout accurate to the shape that has been drawn or designed, right, that we looked at our scenic design drawing. We wanna get that shape replicated. And so these are tools that you use for not just measuring, although measuring can be part of their goal, but also for making sure you're orienting all of your materials correctly and replicating the layout correctly for the project. So the framing square is a steel L-shaped square. It's usually two feet in one direction and a little more than a foot in the other direction. And this is really useful for making sure that connections between pieces of wood are square to each other because it's a long enough piece of material that you're able to like stretch out the piece of wood in each direction and get those two to join into a, in a square corner, which is important. It's important that things are square and plumb um, in order for them to fit together nicely and also for them to be structurally sound. So that's your framing square. This is a speed square and it's more frequently used in, with your chop saw, with your cutting tools, right? So it'll have generally a flange, which is a raised side. And that allows you to hold that speed square up against um, another piece of material or whatever and start kind of lock it in, right? So if you have just a regular triangle, right, it can slip right over the surface that you're trying to put a square edge on. Whereas if you have a speed square, it has a little lip that locks it in. So it would lock in and then you're able to very easily draw a perpendicular line to the edge of that material. So that's what we use frequently when we are setting up cuts on the saws, right? We use our speed square to mark a line that is perpendicular to the edge of the wood in order to create a square cut or to give us a guide to create that square cut. And you'll also see on this one, it has angle markings. So that allows you to quickly create those lines at those different degree angles, which is important if you're trying to like cut a, a specific angle on a piece of wood so that they come together correctly in a layout situation and other like in a pivot point and inch markings, other um, useful and handy components, right? Of this particular tool. And then we have a framing square, which is much larger typically. So I'm sorry, a drywall square. A framing square is the sort of this sized object and a drywall square is much larger. It does a lot of the same things, right? Um, it acts kind of like if you've done any drafting, it acts kind of like a T-square. So it gives you the ability to create a nice long straight line that's perpendicular to another piece of material. And in this case, it also would have a flange sometimes, so you can kind of lock it in. Or um, in other cases where you need a longer piece of material to make sure that it is aligned um, perpendicular to something, that's where you would use your drywall square. Then we have um, the chalk line, a secret weapon, which is literally a piece of string and it gets wound up with this little like fishing reel situation into this little diamond shaped box. And inside of the box, there is a whole bunch of chalk dust. Usually it's like blue. Sometimes it's red, usually it's blue. Um, and so you like wind it up into the box and then you shake the box to get it all covered in chalk. Shake, 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 shake. So now it's all covered in chalk. And then you pull it out and like some chalk falls off or whatever. But the cool thing, the cool trick, right, is that you hand the little end of it to your friend. And this little end of it is useful if you're if you don't have a friend around. Um, you could like put a screw into the place where it need the other end of wherever it goes, right? And that would allow you to like hook this little um, catch onto that screw if you don't have a friend. But if you have a friend, it's even better because you're like your friend will grab the one end and they'll hold it at the one end of this long line you're trying to create, usually on the stage. And then you walk to the other side of the stage and you like hold it down and you stretch it really tight. And then like one or the other of you like grabs the middle and snaps it. And like a little flurry of chalk dust goes flying up in the air. But what's left behind 
is a perfectly straight line from that stretched string across the stage, wherever you need it. And so this is super useful, um, especially because it's chalk, right? Especially in the case where you're trying to like lay out a paint treatment on a floor where you wanna like get those lines out there, but you don't want them to be like a permanent marker line and you need them to be like 30 feet long. The chalk line is totally your friend because after you've like done whatever you needed to do with it, you can just get out your mop and mop away the chalk and like everything's good, like it's perfect, right? Or when you paint, it'll just kind of like dissolve into the paint and disappear. Um, so that is a chalk line, painter's best friend. Then we have drawing circles, right? So the first one is like a version of a compass, right? So this is not the compass that lets you find your way out of the woods. It's the compass that um, that you use maybe in elementary school or maybe not, or if you ever have drafting class, you'll use one. It's like this little guy, right? This little like beam compass is for drawing circles, right? It's that kind of compass. So this first one, this shop built compass, right? Is typically just two pieces of wood with a bolt in them. So that allows it to open and close. A nail uh, coming out of the end and that gives you your anchor point. So that would be the pointy side of the tiny baby compass is replicated by this nail. And then you have a rubber band that's holding a pencil into this little notched slot, okay? Um, and that becomes the drawing side of it. So then you can just like stick the nail in wherever it needs to go. You can set the uh, radius of whatever arc or circle you're drawing and tighten that bolt to keep it locked that distance. And then you can draw with your little pencil on the other side. So that's one way. The other one is what's called trammel points. And that is similar to this situation, which we won't really talk about. So trammel points are basically little holders for a pencil, okay? And they look like this. So one of them has no pencil, it just has a pointy thing that you can stick in the center of your circle. And then the other one is just like a clamp for a pencil that will hold that pencil to a piece of wood. And so in the case of the trammel points, your beam of your compass, like the, the uh, diameter radius length of your compass is created with a long piece of straight wood from your shop, right? So you don't need to have special extra equipment um, to draw these circles. You can just lock on one end and then put this pencil thing on the other end and you're good to go, right? And you just set that distance, that radius on the piece of wood and you lock on, clamp on those two things on either side. If you need to draw a circle that doesn't fit on a piece of a single piece of wood, right? Um, then you have a couple other options. One of them is to like get out a nice long piece of string, downsides of string, they're stretchy, but you can take a, a piece of string, right? And you can like tie it to a screw in the center of the stage. And then you can like tie it around a pencil, wrap it around a pencil at whatever distance and use that to strike a circle from that center point. Um, or you can like play this game with the two sticks. Um, you can also get out your projector, like there's lots of ways, but the main two that we talk about are like this shot built compass and then this trammel points idea because otherwise you would never have heard the word trammel points before. So that is a tool, there you go. It's a tool, it's a hand tool. So then this one you may have encountered when trying to hang pictures in your house. So this is a bubble level and it has little vials um, filled with liquid with a little bubble in the middle of them. And there are markings where are, yeah, here it is, close up, I could look at this part. So there are markings in which that bubble falls, right? And when it is centered between those two marks, then you know that that horizontal, that this line is level to the ground. And plum, on the other hand, is your vertical, right? So level is horizontal, so something's perfectly horizontal when it's level. Something's perfectly vertical when it's plum. And there are a couple of other tools to determine plum. So you can either turn this le bubble level on its side and then these two 
bubbly sections will give you a perfect spot in the center, or a bubble right in the center of the marking when it's perfectly vertical. Um, or you can use what's called a plum bob, which is just like a pointy thing that you tie on a string and then gravity keeps the string perfectly straight and it pulls the plum bob straight up and down. So that's how you know something is perfectly vertical. Level and plum are a little bit tricky because most of the time we don't spend our lives in houses or other existing buildings, especially older structures that are perfectly level or plumb. So you can get into a situation where you're like, I'm bringing in the set. And then you determine, oh, interesting. The floor isn't actually level. So that means that my scenery is a little slanty because the floor is a little slanty. And you have to correct, right? Or you have to like adjust based on that. So you can't assume things like floors are level or walls are plumb. Can't make those assumptions. We have to actually assess each individual piece of scenery. So that is the end of our measuring marking layout tools. So now we get into our more like classic hand tools, the kinds of stuff you'll find like chilling in a toolbox in somebody's dad's garage. Okay. So first up wrenches. Okay. So the one you'll find the most often on a theater stage is a crescent wrench, which is like the Kleenex of adjustable wrenches. It has this little spirally uh, knob right here that you adjust with your thumb to change the opening of the wrench. So this is what most of our stage electricians are going to use because we tend to loosen and tighten bolts from a bunch of different uh, of a, a bunch of different sizes from different manufacturers. So it's the most convenient tool. And if we were doing stagecraft in person, I would have made you buy, buy one, but then we didn't. So you don't have to, um, if you are going to work in the theater, it's a good tool to have. Um, you'll be real handy at the load in if you can use a wrench. So this is the whole righty tighty lefty loosey tightening and loosening. Okay. Um, the secret of it is that there tends to be a little bit of an offset between the angle of the wrench and the angle of the mouth of the wrench. And so you can, generally speaking, you can see it a little better here, right? You can flip your wrench over to get a better grip or to like get into a tighter space and uh, as you tighten or loosen and depending on which direction you're going. So that's something you just get the feel of as you work with a wrench. Then there are wrenches that are one size, a specific size. Those are called open end wrenches um, because they are open on the ends. They come in specific sizes that match the, the bolts that they would uh, tighten or loosen. And then a box end wrench is designed with these little star teeth to go all the way around the bolt and tighten or loosen it, right? Uh, and we don't use those as often in the theater, but mostly we use our, our crescent wrench. Now there are times when you're going to be tightening things forever and ever and ever, right? You're going to be tightening bolts that are holding legs onto a platform, right? Um, when you're tightening the bolt of a light, you're typically tightening it like two half turns. So you're like, eh, eh, and it's tight. When you're tightening a bolt on a on the leg of a platform, right? So you're like holding two pieces of wood together with this bolt, you're gonna be wrenching for a real long time. And in those situations, a socket wrench is a great tool because what a socket wrench has, inside of it has a ratchet, which is like a one-way latch that allows you to turn freely in one direction and then locks in in the direction that you're trying to work. So what that allows you to do, right, is instead of having to remove the wrench, move it back over here in order to keep going, it'll basically let you slip back and keep going, slip back and keep going. So then you can just kind of and it gets tight. Um, so that's your socket wrench. When we get into our um, power tools, there's air versions, there's pneumatic powered ratcheting wrenches. Um, and those are amazing. Cause then you just like squeeze the, the handle and it does all of the, the spinning. So like, that's what at the mechanic shop they're using a lot of the time. It's like an air powered ratcheting wrench. 
So that's a socket wrench. There is, this is important here, there's a little switch on the top of a socket wrench that allows you to change the direction that it is ratcheting in. So if you're tightening things, your socket wrench will not loosen them unless you switch its direction and then it will loosen those things. Um, so we do have wrench sizing that comes in two different flavors. So there are both millimeter sized wrenches and inch sized wrenches. And that's because certain machine parts are going to be manufactured in metric system scale uh, because that's what the world uses for generally engineered elements. Whereas we in construction, um, in like general construction, we're, we're using the imperial system. And so we will have our, our bolts will be sized in the imperial system. But typically if you're looking at a set of wrenches, you'll either find both, um, or you'll find that there's two sets back there. One of them will be millimeters and the other one will be inches. And you'll just need to know which bolt you're trying to tighten or loosen. It's also very useful to like grab the bolt. If you're going to go find the wrench, um, and not trust that, you know, and like test the wrench in the, in the cat, like in the cabinet, in the closet with the tools in the tool room to make sure it's the right one before you walk all the way back out onto the stage with the wrong wrench. So that's a good tip. Then we have pliers. So slip joint pliers are, so pliers are basically any tool that's grabbing, right? So they're for grabbing situations. Um, slip joint pliers have a loose pin here in the center and that allows you to adjust the size to the thing that you're trying to grab. So you can either slip that slip joint close together and grab a smaller thing or you can open it up and grab a bigger thing. Um, and so that gives you a little bit of flexibility with your pliers. Needle nose pliers, you'll see a lot. Um, we use them for everything from like pulling staples, right, to grabbing little things and manipulating them. So it's a good way to get more grip strength, to get more leverage, is to use that pair of pliers so that you can grab onto that thing and then you have a handle on it. Um, that is especially true with a vice grip, right? So needle nose pliers, slip joint pliers, those will tend to release as soon as you stop gripping them. So if you like aren't, if you're like at the county fair and you're like winning the game where you pull the the little thing, you have like excellent grip strength, then you're gonna do real well with those other pliers, right? But if you go to the county fair and you squeeze the thingy and like, it just kind of like doesn't do it, right? No, no bells ring. You're like, my grip strength, not so great. Vice grips are the secret for you. So a vice grips um, pliers has a little jaw, right? It also has this adjustment screw and it has a latching system. So your vice grips will literally lock onto whatever thing you're trying to grab. So this is the tool we go for if, for example, the head of the screw has broken off and I need to still get it out of the piece of wood, but there's nothing for me to, to like go at with my screwdriver. There's no head on the screw. So I need to grab it and like twist it out. The vice grips will allow you to really lock on to something more tightly than you can grip with your hands. And then it'll give you that handle where you'll have more leverage, right? So that's your vice grips. Pipe wrench is, oh, and here's this thingy. There's this little thingy inside. That's how you release it. So then a pipe wrench is a big, big, big wrench. So this is like, this is like this long, right? So the rest of these are like this big. Pipe wrench is like that big, right? That's what we're using typically to tighten and loosen large, like connections on large pieces of pipe, right? So it's bigger, its mouth is bigger. It lets you tighten down onto that piece of pipe and rotate the whole thing, okay? And that's why it has that nice long arm because you need a lot of leverage if your pipes are tightly tightened together. So we'll also use that for things like boom bases, which are the heavy weights that the lighting booms screw into, booms being vertical pipes in this case. So that'll be a, a pipe wrench is what we'll use to make sure that that's all the way screwed into the base to make sure it's nice and tight and safe. 
So then we have just a couple more. Um, we have some cutting tools. These are cutting typically not things like, these are cutting tools for generally wire, metal materials, things that are heavier than just a string or a rope, right? So if we're talking about a string or a rope, you'll usually use like a mat knife, a box cutter, a pocket knife, or um, a heavy duty pair of scissors. But once you get above that, you might need bolt cutters for thicker wire, right? Or for bolts. Bolts are a thing that we encounter in stagecraft. Um, so that's what bolt cutters are for. They're also good if you leave your lock on your locker and then you never come back and we need to get your locker in order to like let someone else use it. They're good for cutting the locks off of those. And then diagonal pliers um, are, or diagonal cutters, right? Those are your general purpose wire cutters. You'll use them to pull staples sometimes, although there's a special tool for that. Um, you'll use them just to cut wire in general purpose situations. All right, almost there you guys, we're getting close. So screwdrivers come in two basic flavors, although there are more, which we'll look at on the next slide. But the Phillips head screwdriver is the one that looks like this. It's a little crosshairs on your screw or bolt. And a flat head screwdriver is just a slot right? So it's also called a slot screwdriver. Um, and so that is just a line going in one direction. Uh, the number, number two refers to the general gauge. So the general like thickness of the blades of your screwdriver. So most of them are number two screwdrivers. Um, you can get, if you have like a tinier screw, you can get smaller ones than that and bigger ones than that. And then, um, the length of the screwdriver given in inches would be like how you would order it. But generally you're gonna like go into the tool room and you're gonna grab either the flat or Phillips head screwdriver that you need. Um, and it's gonna be whichever one is there is the one that you get. So there are some other screw types that you might run into. So a slot is just one line across. A Phillips is that X, that cross. Um, a clutch drive, I've not really found a whole lot of that. Torques are the little star bits. Um, those are typically found on things where you want it to be like a locked thing, right? You don't want it to be easy to get it out. Um, and so you'll find those little star bit screws, for example, on the bottom of your MacBook. If you can take your MacBook apart, you're going to need a little star screwdriver. Um, Robertson is going to be a rectangular bit. This is often found in shops. We don't really use them, but they're often found in a scene shop because they're harder to strip. So stripping a screw, right, is when you're trying to turn a Phillips screw, but instead your screwdriver keeps slipping. And so instead of locking in to that cross and turning the screw, it actually sort of bores out the X of the cross, right? Um, and Robertson's are a little harder to do that. They're a little easier to drive and a little tougher to accidentally spin your screwdriver and ruin the ability to lock into it and remove the screw. And then an Allen is a hexagonal drive head. Um, and this is what you'll find on like all your Ikea furniture. You'll get those little Allen wrenches that come with it. Um, so those are your like hex wrenches, right? So they're like Allen keys, hex wrenches, whatever. You can also find them in the shop, typically in what looks like a little, like, uh, pocket, like a little like pocket knife situation with all the different Allen keys that pop open. Um, and so that is where you'll find those. They also can have a security version sometimes where there's actually a pin in the center of the Allen slot. And so you need a specific Allen wrench, which has a hole drilled in the center of it in order to um, tighten or re remove those screws. And I find them most frequently in my experience in the theater on like projector mounts, which are intended to prevent someone from stealing your projector by making it just a little bit harder to undo the bolts that are holding it into its mount. For smashing things, we have hammers, right? There are two basic woodworking hammers. There's a curved claw and a straight claw. The curved claw is better for prying, right? So it's better because of this curve, it allows you to like pull nails out a little bit more easily. You'll have a little more leverage. And then a straight claw 
um, is also useful um, in different prying scenarios, right? So it kind of depends on what you need to get out of it. Um, in general, the way we think about our hammer, right, is that there's a weight on the end of it and you hold it as far down the handle as you can and that allows principles of physics to drive whatever you're hitting with the maximum force for as little effort as is possible, right? So a bad habit that people will get into because they're afraid of accidentally smashing things with their, with their hammer is they'll hold it really close to the head of the hammer. Um, and that's like fine, except that now you have to do all of that work. Whereas if you hold it far away, the hammer is doing more of the work. Um, we'll also find rubber mallets. Those are what we use to close paint can lids, right? Any situation when we don't want to damage whatever it is that we're hammering, a rubber mallet is the tool for the job. Um, we'll also use rubber mallets if we're like removing bolts from wood, right? Because you don't want to hammer on the end of the bolt because then the threads will get all messed up and you won't be able to put a nut on it anymore. So you'll use a rubber mallet to knock it out without damaging the threads of that metal bolt. And then the last one here is a ball peen hammer, which has a ball on one side and a flat face on the other side. It's generally a smaller hammer um, and it's for more fine workmanship. Um, and also it's used frequently for like metal working, which we don't do a lot of in theater, but like that's if you're like a silversmith, you're gonna use something like a ball peen hammer where you have some uh, better control with the ball end or the flat face, depending on exactly the kind of work that you're doing. So now we have clamps. This is our last slide of this sequence. Um, so clamps we use to hold things in places, right? Most frequently we're holding pieces of wood in place while glue dries. Like that's usually what I'm using a clamp for. Um, they're also useful if you want to hold things together temporarily and you don't want to like permanently attach them to each other. So your C-clamp, um, and this is a woodworking C-clamp, not a light hanging C-clamp, which is a slightly different thing you'll run into later. But um, a woodworking C-clamp is the shape of a C and you spin this little handle in order to make bigger or smaller the opening of the clamp. Um, a pipe clamp uses a piece of pipe um, and there's also bar clamps where they're where it uses like a flat metal bar um, as a structure and then allows you to tighten um, a longer distance, right? So you use a pipe clamp over like the whole flat, right? If you're trying to keep the whole flat or platform square while you drive some, some screws into it, you might use a pipe clamp. Um, you'll also use it if you have a piece of wood that is bowed, right? A bowed piece of wood tends is like a, it's like a C shape instead of straight up and down. So you can use a clamp to force it to be true, to force it to be straight while you attach it to another piece of wood, for example, right? So a pipe clamp is good in those situations. There are wooden clamps um, and these are great because you can adjust the two sides of them independently in order to tighten or clamp together things that aren't supposed to be perfectly square. There's a vice grip clamp, which is like a larger, more open jawed vice grip. So it does the same thing as your vice grip pliers and that it locks in place until you click the little thing to release it. Um, but it's bigger, it has more capacity than just those pliers did. So the pliers are more for like screws and this would be a larger situation. And then the last one is your spring clamp. And that is also sometimes in LA, we call it a grip clip because we do movies out here. Um, and so this is like your standard spring clamp. Like it's like a giant clothespin basically. And we use it in a lot of those same situations, right? So a spring clamp we might use to like clip a curtain back to get it out of the way. Um, anything else where we want to not damage the material, but we do need a little bit more grip um, than a clothespin would give us, a spring clamp is really great in those situations. So that is hand tools. Thank you, I'll talk to you soon, bye.